When nuclear energy has been successfully applied for power production, India will not have to look abroad for its experts, but will find them ready at hand. These were the words of Homi Jahangir Bhabha, the chief architect of India's nuclear program, scientist par excellence, institute builder, theoretical physicist, able administrator, policy maker, multifaceted personality, connoisseur of fine art. Homi Jahangir Bhabha, a great visionary. It shows the absolute necessity of finding some new source of energy if the light of our civilization is not to be extinguished because we have burnt out our fuel reserves. This would exhaust the known reserves of fossil fuels in under a century. It is in this context that we turn to atomic energy for a solution. I venture to predict that a method will be found for liberating fusion energy in a controlled manner within the next two decades. When that happens, the energy problems of the world will truly have been solved forever. Baba dreamt for modern, self-reliant India, highly industrialized and technologically advanced. His solution was both simple and complex, ample electrical power for Indian modernization and industrialization. And he was far-sighted enough to predict the importance of nuclear technology towards this goal. Today, India is a nuclear power. Full credit for the establishment of India's nuclear research program and its nuclear weapons program must be given to Dr. Homi Jihangir Bhabha. He ensured that India's own atomic energy development program progressed to a stage where atomic weapons could be produced in the country without external aid, if called upon to do so. I seriously say to you that business or a job as an engineer is not the thing for me. It is totally foreign to my nature and radically opposed to my temperament and opinions. Physics is my line. I'm burning with the desire to do physics. It is my only ambition. I have no desire to be a successful man or the head of a big firm. There are other intelligent people who like that and let them do it. I therefore earnestly implore you to let me do physics. This was a letter written by an 18-year-old Homi Jahangir Bhabha from England to his parents in India. Homi Jahangir Bhabha was born on 30th October 1909 in a wealthy Parsi family of Mumbai, having a long tradition of learning and service in the field of education. His grandfather was the Inspector General of Education in the state of Mysore. Bhabha's father, Jahangir Hormuzji Bhabha, was an Oxford alumni and a lawyer. Dr. Baba's paternal aunt, Mehrbai, married Sir Dorabji Tata. Baba attended the cathedral and John Connon School in Bombay. After passing senior Cambridge examination at the age of 15, he entered the Elphinstone College in Bombay and later the Royal Institute of Science. He was not much interested in sports, but was absolutely brilliant in studies. When Baba finished school, he was put by Baba into the Institute of Science, then it was called Royal Institute of Science. And there, he soon found that he was being taught what he had learned two years earlier at school. At the age of 18, Dr. Bhabha left for England to pursue higher studies at Cambridge to study engineering. In 1927, Bhabha joined the Gonvere and Caius College in Cambridge. He took the Mechanical Sciences Tripos in 1930. So, Homi at that time said, I want to strike a bargain with you. You will get your first class from me on the condition that you will finance me for two more years to do the Mathematics Tripos. After passing the mechanical tripos with first class, Bhabha passed the mathematics tripos two years later. Bhabha was taught by Nobel laureate Paul Adrian Morris Dirac, the location professor of mathematics at Cambridge and an authority in quantum theory. Later, Bhabha joined the Cavendish Laboratory. Bhabha held Solomon's studentship in engineering during 1931-1932. 
During 1932 to 1934, he held the Rouse Ball traveling studentship in mathematics. He traveled in Europe and worked with Wolfgang Pauli in Zurich. In January 1933, Homi Baba received his doctorate in nuclear physics after publishing his first scientific paper, The Absorption of Cosmic Radiation. The paper helped him win the Isaac Newton studentship in 1934. In early 1934, he went to Italy to work at Enrico Fermi's Institute of Physics in Rome. During this period, he mostly worked in Cambridge, except for a short period when he worked with Niels Henrik David Bohr at Copenhagen. At Cambridge, Bhabha's work centered on cosmic rays. The most important of the papers that Bhabha wrote in positron physics is the one dealing with what has come to be known as Bhabha scattering which is Baba's crowning achievement in the area of positron physics. Baba's scattering revolves around exchange effects in electron-positron scattering. It was believed that matter and antimatter, namely electron and positron, when they come together, will annihilate each other. But Dr. Baba was the first scientist to realize that something else could also happen, namely scattering, which in his honor today is called Baba scattering. Watching two white billiard balls collide, we were able to say which ball went where. Even though the balls look identical, this is because we are able to follow the trajectories of the individual particles. Scattering, as the very name implies, throws off the incident particles in various directions. Faith in the formula is so much that is used routinely as a calibration for other scattering cross sections and provides the the precise value for other cross-sections which are measured at labs at CERN and other places. Baba also explained the cosmic ray shower formation in a paper published in 1937. Baba and Heitler were one of the first people who did extensive calculation of what the development of shower would look like and what will be its detailed properties. The charge particle as it travels down, uh, releases a high energy gamma ray, and the gamma ray multiplies into an electron and a positron. And uh, then again, these things annihilate and produce more gamma rays. Interestingly, when Carl David Anderson discovered a new particle in the cosmic radiation with a mass between that of electron and the proton, he named it mesoton. Hava had predicted on the basis of his analysis that there should be a particle of intermediate mass between the proton and the electron. And that turned out to be the case with the humerson. Today, however, this particle is known as muon. And even now, the study of muon is providing us with very important insight into the functioning of the solar system. Bahaba was on a vacation in India in 1939 when World War II broke out in Europe. During this enforced extended holiday at home, he was deeply affected by the turbulent period at the dawn of the independence. He was looking for a position to stay back in uh, India for some time. He was offered many professorships. One of them was in Allahabad University, which he did not take up. In 1940, Bahaba joined the Indian Institute of Science at Bangalore as reader. Here, yeah, at that time, Chandrasekhar Venkataraman was heading the physics department. In 1941, Bhabha was elected the Fellow of the Royal Society London, Dr. Raman being one of the proposers of his nomination. He wrote the thesis titled, The Theory of Elementary Particles and Their Interaction, for which the Adams Prize was awarded in 1942. In the same year, he was promoted to a full professorship in cosmic ray research at the IISC. At Bangalore, Baba initiated experiments to study the so-called hard component of the cosmic rays. But even the basic equipment for the purpose was not available, so Baba decided to build the devices indigenously. A unique Geiger counter telescope was used by Baba. It is made of four Geiger counters with lead shield in between. He built a Geiger counter telescope for cosmic ray research and took it up in that B-39 aeroplane to various altitudes. Homi Baba measured the cosmic ray intensity as a function of altitude and latitude. To achieve the high altitudes, rubber balloons were not available. 
A balloon flight group was set up and then experiments were done in the penetrating component of cosmic rays at various latitudes. High-energy cosmic rays are the highest energetic particle which are coming on the Earth. This particle, when they enter the Earth atmosphere, they interact with the various nuclear present in the atmosphere and form extensive air shower. We study and try to find out what was the origin of the cosmic rays. We have installed 400 plastic scintillation detectors. In addition to that, 3712 proportional counter have also been installed, which have been shifted from the old polar goldfield experiments and they have been used here as a muon. Detector, it makes it the world's most sensitive and the largest muon tracking telescope. Bhava also built a 12 inch diameter circular cloud chamber to study the scattering characteristics of mesons. The cloud chambers are very important device to visualize the propagation and interaction of high energy particles. In the early 1940s, when Bhava was working at the Indian Institute of Science, there was no institute in the country which had the necessary facilities for original work in nuclear physics, high energy physics, cosmic rays, and other frontiers of knowledge in physics. On 19th August 1943, he wrote an informal letter. Namaste. Good afternoon. On behalf of organizing committee, I welcome you all on today's satellite event of National Conference on Contribution of Dr. Homi J. Babhas in Nation Building. So today we have with us uh, formal Director General of CSIR India and the Secretary of Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, DSIR, Ministry of Science and Technology, and President of Vigyan Bharti, Dr. Sekhar C. Mande. Uh, sir, welcome you. Uh, one of our uh, guests, uh, who is still in the guest house due to some health issue, uh, we have with us today, hopefully he will join soon, uh, the formal director, Indira Gandhi National, uh, Indira Gandhi Center for Atomic Research, IGCAR, Kalpakkam, and Padam Sri Awadi, Sri S.P. Bhojeji. Uh, but uh, he could not join right now. He will join us soon. I <clears throat> also welcome Director R.R. Kat Indor, Dr. S.P. Nakhe as our special guest. Sir, welcome you here. And we have with us also Professor S.S. Joshi, Director of IIT Indor. So we welcome you here. Thank you all for your gracious presence in today's event. So moving uh, ahead, now I request Professor S.S. Joshi, Director IT Indore, to formally welcome Dr. Sekhar Simande, 
by offering the bouquet. So please. And I again request Professor Joshi to please uh, offer the bouquet to uh, Director Arar Cat, Dr. S. V. Nake. Uh, now I request uh, Professor Avinash Sonavane, uh, Dean of International Affairs, to offer the bouquet to our Director, Professor Sir Joshi. <laughs> <laughs> so since the event is uh, we are remembering uh, Dr. Homi J. Bhabha, so now I invite all the guests on the dais to please unwrap the photo of Dr. Homi J. Bhabha, please. And sir, requested to please offer the flowers. <clears throat> so thank you very much, sir. So I know you must have a query that what is the background of this event? So this event is the part of our main event, that is the National Conference on Contribution of Dr. Homi J. Bhabha's in Nation Building, which is scheduled tomorrow at 4th of November at RRCAT Indore. But our satellite events are already going on, and we were having five satellite events at different places, um, which was started on 30th of October 2022, on the birthday of Dr. Homi J. Bhabha. The event name was the Vigyan Jyoti Yatra and celebration of birth anniversary. It was happened at SGITS Indore. Then subsequently, we had the event at DAVB Indore, then the Emerald Height International School. And yesterday, we had an event at Hulka Science College Indore. And today, we are at IIT Indore campus. So if you ask about the event, it is a small step to remembering the contribution of our scientists in Indian freedom struggle, as well as India's development, which is hardly discussed among us. And on the eve of Ajadi Ka Amrit Mahotso, Vigyan Bharti has decided to celebrate the birthdays of 22 national scientists who were the unsung heroes of our national independence movement. Dr. Homi Jagir Baba is one of them who not only contributed to the national freedom struggle but also played a very important role in the nation building after independence. To know more about this, let us move ahead. Now I invite Dr. S. V. Nakhe, Director RRCAT Indore. Sir, please address the guardians about this event. Thank you. Professor Mandeji, Professor Swaz Joshi, faculty members, students at IIT, and my colleagues present here. This is a very remarkable event. And uh, I'm going to give a very small introduction. And why this event? Because uh, Dr. Bhava passed away long ago, and his contributions are well known. So a natural question comes, and his uh, contributions are well reported in the papers also, and uh, published literature and books. So why such an event is required, and what is its impact? 
I would say Dr. Bhava has a, such a multifaceted personality and great contributions. But if you look into and uh, study his uh, life and contributions, we can draw large inspiration and insights that will inspire us to contribute better. So I think that is the background of all this. And uh, we had uh, so many national level scientists who had uh, contributed not only to the science technology, but to the nation building also. And as many of these facts remain unnoticed because of uh, highlighting of their one particular aspects and other aspects are out of sight. So if we consider all these aspects on events organized on such memorable dates, then that will give much more exposure to their contributions and uh, that will be highly beneficial. So this is the background why these type of events are organized and uh, why those should be organized in a big way. So as such, uh, we know Dr. Bhava is a father or architect of Indian nuclear program in totality. He was a great visionary and uh, man of actions also. There are some persons are only visionaries, but uh, Bhava has that quality that he was not only a visionary, but he was a man of actions. Or in other way, he was a, not only a dreaming person, but a doing person. Because if you see the institutions built by Dr. Bhava, they are doing great and uh, spread across the country and addressing various areas. How a person like uh, can contribute in such a wide spectrum is uh, really amazing. And uh, some of the origin goes to his education also. You see, he started his career as a mechanical engineer that may not be knowing to many of the persons here or in general. So he started as a mechanical engineer, then gone into the mathematics and then pursued in the theoretical physics, particularly high energy particle physics. So in this early, his education has a, such a wide spectrum and that too at the most prestigious institutes in the world at uh, UK. Subsequently started contributing in other areas. And um, before the independence, he has a significant contribution in the area of uh, particle physics, particularly at the age of just 24, whatever is the uh, first paper itself, got him a big scholarship of uh, three years in UK. And um, you can notice at the age of 39, he was a uh, chairman of the atomic energy establishment at that time. So that is the type of contribution Dr. Bhava has done. Many of his quotes are quite well known. And uh, if we learn those by heart, I think those will be great source of inspiration for all of us. And for new generation, particularly what he has said that um, I know clearly what is my aim of life. So that clarity was there with him just at the age of 25 or so. And he said that I know how to contribute. And uh, he said that lifespan is limited, that cannot be increased. So I have to increase my contributions. I have to increase my intensity of efforts. And um, those who worked with him or within DA, they know with what passion and intensity he contributed to the various aspects. Although he was contributing to the development of nuclear reactors, nuclear program as such. But he was at the same time in late night hours or early morning hours, he used to have architectural sketches, landscape sketches that how the institute should be developed. So he has uh, institutional building characteristics. He was great scientific administrator. And uh, what may not be known is he was a great artist also. He was a great painter and he has a very good musical year and uh, many other when he was good at writing also. So these are the various multifaceted aspects of Dr. Bhava. And uh, we can definitely draw inspiration from his life. And in today's program, we'll have uh, probably Dr. Bhoje will be joining very shortly. Dr. Bhava introduced the very well-known three-stage nuclear power program for India that within first stage will go with natural uranium, which is quite abundant in India initially. And then we'll go to the fast reactor technology and subsequently utilization of thorium. Thorium is the largest 
uh, we are, India is the largest source of thorium in the world, so that we'll have a um, uh, indefinite source or say a very long term source of uh, nuclear power or uh, energy, electrical energy within the country. And nuclear energy is just one part, but he was uh, quite clear on the nuclear weapons, nuclear disarmament, and uh, with uh, Baba's contributions, space program emerged out of uh, Department of Atomic Energy. And uh, our space program is also contributing extremely well. It is one of the best successful program in the world. And within Department of Atomic Energy, Dr. Bhava's contributions are very well known, but we thought that with this event, we'll take these contributions to the particularly young minds who are in their formative years and they can draw inspiration from that and contribute greatly to the nation building. Dr. Bhava has himself said that um, it is a duty of every Indian researcher to contribute in a better way for nation building by remaining in India, provided we get this due appreciation and facilities. And I'm sure these facilities and appreciations are very well available now within the country. I think Professor Mande will also elaborate on some of these aspects. So with this brief introduction, I thank all of you for being here and giving your patience listening. I thank all dignitaries who had uh, agreed for this event to be here. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. S. V. Nakhe, uh, briefing us about the event as well as about Dr. Bhava. Uh, now I request you again, sir, Dr. Nakhe, uh, please uh, invite our uh, expert, uh, Professor Mande, to deliver the lecture and also. Uh, introduce the speaker, sir, please. Dr. Bhoja is not well, but he will be joining very shortly. So that the sequence has changed uh, what has been planned earlier. So it's my pleasure and duty to give a brief introduction of um, Dr. Shekhar Mande. Uh, Dr. Shekhar Mande is a structural and computational biologist. He was the, as told earlier, he was the Director General of the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research, CSIR India, and the Secretary of the Department of Scientific and Industrial Research, known as DSIR, Ministry of Science and Technology. Before his services at CSIR, he was the Director of the National Center for Cell Science at Pune. Dr. Mande did his MSc in Physics from University of Nagpur, and holds a doctoral degree in molecular biophysics from the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Following his PhD, he joined Professor Vim J. Hall as postdoctoral fellow at uh, Netherlands in 1991. And in 1992, he joined as a senior fellow at the University of Washington, Seattle, USA. On his return to India, Dr. Shekhar Mande joined the CSIR Institute of Microbial Technology, Chandigarh, as a scientist, and in 2001 was selected as a staff scientist at the Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics, Hyderabad, in 2011. Dr. Mande was in 2011. Dr. Mande was appointed as the director of NCCS Pune, and he served in various advisory committees of the Government of India. In 2005, he was awarded the Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Prize for Science and Technology, the most prestigious science award in India, in the category of biological sciences. He has been honored with, the, with several other prestigious awards, including B.M. Birla Young Scientist Award in 1999 and um, Welcome Trust International Senior Fellow 2005-2008. He has been elected Fellow of the all the three major science academies in the country, the Indian National Science Academy, INSA, National Academy of Sciences, NASI, and uh, Indian Academy of Sciences. He's also life member of the Indian Crystallographic Association, the Indian Science Congress Association, and the Indian Biophysical Society. Dr. Mande is also credited with the BC Goha Memorial Award Lecture of the Indian National Science Academy 2017, uh, and a BK Bachavat Memorial Lecture of the National Academy of Sciences 2017. Dr. Mande is the president of Vigyan Bharati, 
as you know, Vigyan Bharti is a national movement for the propagation and popularization of science, science and technology among the students and the masses. Viva promotes scientific contributions made by India from ancient to the present time. And uh, as you must have realized, as Dr. Bhava has indicated, he moved to India to contribute to the development of India, although he was doing very well overseas there. And I know he has been excellent researcher, taking keen interest in uh, synchrotron beam lines at RRCAT. Sir, we welcome you for this program and invite you for the talk. Thank you, Dr. Nake, for so very much for the kind introduction. Dr. Nake, Professor Zoshi, uh, all the dignitaries present here, colleagues and friends. It's a great pleasure for me to be able to be with you today when we are going to celebrate tomorrow uh, Dr. Bhabha's achievements, as Dr. Nake said. Now, uh, all of you are aware that uh, Vigyan Bharti is an organization that promotes uh, science and technology in the country in a very rational manner. It was founded in 1991, but the primary objective of Vigyan Bharti is also to promote science and technology in the Swadeshi spirit. And the reason for that has been for several years, almost for two centuries, we had been told that India did not have well-developed science and technology through the ages. And we had also been told that Indians did not have a mind which could rationally analyze events around them. Macaulay is very typically demonized for the statements that he made about Indian education system, but Macaulay was not the only one. The entire British system actually felt that Indians did not have mind to rationally think about uh, whatever situations. And a large number of scientists who fought that particular thinking of the British, that it is not true. India has indeed a great scientific tradition over the years. After all, many of the earliest mathematical treatises were written in India. Uh, just to remind you, Bhaskaracharya's Bijaganita was written very close from Indore, right? And it was in the 10th or 11th century. Aryabhata's discoveries were made in India. Indians had made very precise calculations of planetary motions. It was all in pre-Newtonian days. If Vesanas think that only differential calculus and integral calculus is necessary to map planetary motions, that's not correct because Indians had done it much before differential calculus was uh, invented. Similarly, metallurgy was extraordinarily well developed. Many of you are aware that uh, the word you would have heard of Damascus sword, the steel for Damascus sword was typically made in India for, for about last 2000 years. So iron ore used to be taken and incubated with bamboo leaves, which became a source of carbon. And together it used to be put in a crucible and then put in an oven. And that's how the steel was made. And when British arrived here, they did not think that anything could be superior to Sheffield steel. And they were confronted with the steel, what was called Woods steel in India. And then they realized that Woods steel is far superior to British steel. And none other than Michael Faraday acknowledged that wood steel process is actually better than the one that is made in Sheffield. And uh, this steel, of course, has been used in things like Damascus sword and things like that. So these are the few examples of what Indian science actually had done. And there's many things that we can actually go on talking about. And therefore, what British actually tried to perpetuate, that we did not have mind which could think rationally, many Indian scientists actually stood up during the freedom struggle and said that we can indeed think rationally on par with you can. People like Jesse Bose, for example, he was denied full salary because he was Indian in presidency college by the British. And for two years, he did not take salary and still taught in presidency college. What actually becomes the first incidence of Satyagraha? And when British realized their mistake, they restored complete salary of Jesse Bose 
and then he continued to teach in the presidency college on par with the British professors. Now, these are historical evidence what British actually felt about India. Lokman Network of all the people felt that plague is a continuous problem in India and to overcome plague, Indian scientists must come up with plague vaccine. And for that in 1880s, Lokmanya Tirak founded a laboratory called the Imperial Laboratory. That laboratory was founded in Pune. Eventually it moved to Mukteshwar and today the laboratory is now located in Izzatnagar, what we call as the Indian Veterinary Research Institute, IVRI. That was founded by Lokmanya Tirak in 1880s. So these are the kind of examples that what Indian political leaders, the social movement leaders and the scientists have actually stood up together and tried to fight the British thought that India did not have the power to think rationally. And Vigyan Bharati is one of the uh, principal aims is actually take it to the people today, those who are still brainwashed by the Western thoughts that we indeed have had a great tradition of science and technology in the country and how India has developed as a nation in 75 years as one of the major world powers today. And my objective of giving this talk is essentially to tell you how science and technology actually has helped the country in developing in the last 75 years. And in that sense, India stands as a unique example around the world that in 75 years of history, how one can change entire nation, how one can bring people out of poverty through sheer applications of science and technology, a large number of people. And that actually we go down in history as a very, very unique example. Because many other countries became independent about five or 10 years plus minus India's independence. But India stands out unique, whether it has a unique space program, it has a unique atomic energy program, it has a unique defense R&D program, it has a unique civilian R&D program. And let us look at some aspects of this uh, in the next half an hour or so that I will actually talk to you about. And Vigyan Bharati takes a pride in bringing this to people, all these achievements. And some of you who would have noticed uh, about a month ago, there was a conference of all the science and technology ministers of different states together that was held in Ahmedabad. And Honorable Prime Minister inaugurated the conference and Honorable Prime Minister appealed to the scientific community that please go to the society and celebrate achievements of scientists pre-independence so that actually we'll, you will know what scientists have done for the country. What we are going to do today is post-independence uh, in that particular respect. Now, uh, uh, just to look at 1947, right? I mean, very often it's very difficult to look back upon the time. We ourselves have forgotten that almost all of us in this audience have lived in an era in which there were no mobile phones. And we have lived in an era, some of us in this particular audience, when there were actually getting telephones at home was very difficult. Getting a scooter, used to take about seven years of waiting period and so on and so forth. So we often forget what happened 10 years ago, what happened 20 years ago. We lived in an era which has pre-internet. You know, I mean, most of the people here have probably been born in a pre-internet era. And how life was is very difficult to imagine. But let us go back to 1947 and see how we were. India's population was about 340 million and the literacy was about 12%. We have about four times the population now, and the literacy has now jumped to about almost 75% or something. Shashi Tharoor has written a very good book, and I would recommend many people to read the book called The Era of Darkness, in which he debunks every myth that the British perpetuated in India. British said that you are not a single country. Shashi Tharoor said, we have been a single country for ages. He said, you are a very uneducated country. Shashi Tharoor says that we taught you education. Uh, okay. British said it did not have science and technology. Shashi Dharu says that a decimal system we brought to the world. The discovery of zero we brought to the world. So please recognize this particular fact. So, oh, so and so he goes upon. And there he actually comments that in the year 1700, India's contribution to world GDP was 27%. Okay. Today, USA's contribution to world GDP is less than 20%. 1700, India's contribution to world GDP was 27%. In the year 1800, this was 23%. So British fought their first war, the East India Company fought the first war on our soil in 1757, right? 
India was a very, very prosperous society. It was extraordinary affluent society by then. And that's what actually used to attract people from all over the world who used to come to India. Most of whom make, would make India as home. But a small group of people who came from Europe, the British, and they did not make India home, the entire objective was to exploit our country, take all the wealth from here, and in process become prosperous themselves. So the GDP of India in 1947 was 2.7 lakh crore. Today it is 150 lakh crore. In 1947, two major events that we see in history. We have had a Bengal famine in 1943, where about 30 lakh people died. Bengal famine, okay? And that's all because of the mismanagement of the administrative system. 30 lakh people died. Can you imagine today so many people dying anywhere because of famine? Now just to give you, uh, remind you, 1757, British fought the first war in Plassey. The East India Company fought for a war in Plassey. From 1770 onwards, every 25 years, there has been a major famine in the country. Just look at Google on history of famines in India. Every 25 years, each famine would account for about 1 to 3 million people. So 10 lakh to 30 lakh people would die in each famine. 1943, thankfully, was the last of those. In independent India, we have not had a famine in which so many people died of hunger. Isn't that an achievement? That achievement, I'm actually going to tell you how it actually happened. We witnessed one of the largest migrations in humankind. One of the largest migrations, which was very violent across the border, very artificially created. What was the need to create this? We were a very happy one single country. But British said that you had to be two countries. And that created extraordinary chaos. And on the top of that, they appointed a person to draw a line, international line, who had no clue about India's history, had no clue about India's uh, social structure. And the person came and drew a line hypothetical drawing, say a line saying that one country here, one country there. Absolutely ridiculous today to think of it. There was no industrial development in India. Some people had tried Tata, Prafu Chandra Ray, those of you who are chemists here would know that Prafu Chandra K started the Bengal Chemicals and Pharmaceuticals. So a few people had tried to make industry, but industry was not very strong in India. And India had less than 20 universities. Where would people go for education? And that's why the literacy rate, everything was very low. Right? So this is where we actually start. So this is point 0.0. T is equal to 0. And let us start from that and see how we actually become a major power in the world. So the initial period, of course, was an era of institutional building. Dr. Nake referred to atomic energy. I will briefly tell you about that history as well. But the first publicly funded organization in the country, which the government supported, was CSIR. It was founded in 1942. And I will tell you a brief history of CSIR. But then CSIR also became a mandate to start other organizations in the country. And the first organization that CSIR helped found in 1945 was the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. You know, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research was founded with a tripartite agreement between the Tata Trusts, between the government of Bombay then, and then government of India. And government of India through CSIR funded Tata Institute of Fundamental Research substantially to, so that it could come up on its own. Similarly, CSIR also sowed the seeds of Department of Atomic Energy or the Atomic Energy Commission, and we'll come to that a little later. Uh, the universities, the first of the IITs came in 1950, the IIT Kharagpur, and in about 10 years, we had five IITs in the country. So between 1950 and 1960, the first five IITs, Kanpur, Delhi, Mumbai, Chennai, and Kharagpur, they were in place. And that actually became the base of the technical education. The University Grants Commission came into being in 1953, and the first chairman of UGC was none other than Shantisuru Bhatnagar. And a large number of universities actually started then, and today we have close to about 1,000 state and private universities in the country, and students can actually choose wherever they can go. We have about 23 IITs, and we have about close to 100 universities today, and that forms the base of our higher education in the country. So it's remarkable. In 75 years, no country could have expected to do this thing. Just a brief history of CSIR. CSIR was essentially established uh, in 1940, as I said, the Board of Scientific and Industrial Research, which became Industrial Research Utilization Committee. And eventually, formally, CSIR started on 26 September 1942. 
British had started thinking about CSIR in 1933. There was an editorial in Nature in 1933, in which the editor wrote that there is a case for publicly funding Indian science and technology. And the photo of the person that you see here is Sir Arcot Ramaswamy Mudliya. He was a member of British Commerce Council, and he lobbied significantly with the British, saying that we must have a proper SNT publicly funded organization in the country. And with the efforts of Arkad Ramaswamy Mudliya and associated scientists, Baba, Raman, Bhatnagar, and so on and so forth, CSIS started in 1942. On 26 August 1947, there was a governing body meeting of CSI. Now imagine the uh, word that I have heard and I have not verified this is that on 15th August 1947, Jawaharlal Nehru was found in his chamber writing bylaws of CSI. That's what I have heard. I have not verified this particular fact. But the fact is that 26 August 1947, 11 days after we won independence, CSI's governing body met and Shama Prasad Mukherjee became the first vice president of CSI. So all of you are aware of Shama Prasad Mukherjee and his work in the political system and included in the governing body were Abdul Khwaja Hamid. I don't know whether you have heard of him. The person who started a pharmaceutical company called Sipla. All of you have heard of Sipla. So Abdul Khwaja Hamid was a member of CSI governing body. J.R.D. Tata. I don't have to talk about him. Uh, Bidhan Chandra Roy. Everyone knows about B.C. Roy. Uh, K.S. Krishnan. And they were very famous physicist. Uh, uh, student of Sir C.V. Raman, Jivraj Mehta, Thakka, Birbal Sahani, Homi Bhava, C.V. Raman, and uh, uh, D.N. Vadia. They were the members of CSIS governing body. Now that actually tells you how much emphasis our public system or how much faith our public system had in science and technology. And all of that came together and said that we must develop proper science and technology in the country. This is 1947, 11 days after we won independence. And there begins our journey, how actually everything started. One of the first things that we actually did was, uh, Baba was already saying that India must have a strong atomic energy program. In fact, in 1946, the Board of Scientific and Industrial Research uh, had set up a committee under Baba's leadership to discuss how it can be set up. And finally, on 26th August, 1948, that uh, uh, Atomic Energy Commission came up. CSIR sanctioned about 32,000 rupees to train a group of 10 scientists. So these scientists would be sent abroad and they would be brought back and they would form a nucleus of India's atomic energy program. And that's how actually Atomic Energy Commission was first set up in 1948. And as I said, on 10th August 1948, this is the Gazette notification that came in, signed by none other than Santisuru Bhatnagar, saying that uh, the commission, uh, it will be carried out, all its work will be carried out directly under the guidance of the prime minister. And believe it or not, even today, the chairman of Atomic Energy Commission's office is in the prime minister's office. Where prime minister sits, next door is the office of the chairman of Atomic Energy Commission in Delhi. So this is how actually Atomic Energy Commission started uh, in the beginning. And a lot of actually deliberations took place before how it would be. And of course, Dr. Baba took the leadership to develop the program. As everyone says, rest is history. So uh, the ecosystem that we have today is what you see in the center. We have large number of national labs, which are funded either by CSIR or the Indian Council of Medical Research or the Indian Council of Agricultural Research or the Department of Science and Technology or Department of Biotechnology. They provide a large scope for taking SNT to people, do translational work. On the other hand, you have large number of IITs and universities who keep on generating extraordinary human resources. And we have seen in the last few years what Indian human resources is doing around the world. You know, some of the major companies in the world are now led by people who came out directly from this education system. And it's a great matter of pride for all of us. And then you have on the right hand side also strategic organizations such as the DRDO, Department of Space and Department of Atomic Energy. So together we form a single uh, ecosystem for doing science and technology in the country. Right? I mean this is how actually what we are today and this is how we developed from, uh, in, from the 1947 onwards. I want to give you two or three examples to convince you. Uh, many of these examples people would not have heard. You would have heard probably Green Revolution. 
you would have heard white revolution but some of the very interesting stories behind those is actually what i want to tell you how science and technology actually helped in making this possible you know and let us actually see some of this now one of the first challenges right was to implement democracy in the country the first 19 uh, first elections general elections took place in 1951 right in 1947 no country in the world western europe or us or any other advanced country believed that india could actually remain a single country most of them thought that india would be fragmented in parts very soon no one ever trusted india could become a democracy today everyone envies india being the largest democracy in the world but the challenge in 1951 was how do you ensure that every person who has a right would go and exercise his or her right to uh, cast a vote how do you do that and a person doesn't come back again and again given the history of zamindari in our system you would imagine that a zamindar would go and easily cast 30 votes for all the people who work with zamindar right so we had to make sure that every person only votes once and a job came to national physical laboratory in delhi which is a part of uh, csr laboratories and national physical laboratory developed an indelible ink all of you have used indelible ink there are many people who have not used indelible ink in the audience that was developed is nothing but a silver nitrate solution and that stains your cells on the finger and a stain cannot be taken out you cannot wash it with soap or water or anything or oil or anything even today this indelible ink is used in every possible election in the country not only that today india exports indelible ink to 65 different countries is amazing right if this is not science and technology what is science and technology no other country had done this and the first challenge that we had to implement democracy in a fair manner we overcame that challenge with this particular one and of course you may not recognize the person on left but person on the couple on the right all of you would recognize who they are right so uh, they are all showing how they vote during their elections i told you i mean i will tell you a little bit about green revolution and white revolution some background of that so as i said the last of the famines that we had seen was in 1943 the bengal famine about 3 million people died in that particular famine and a famine like situation started developing in 1965 as almost famine like situation had developed in india 1965 three continuous years the monsoon was very poor and we are going to fall short of food grains what do you do there would be hunger all over and of course there is a possibility that people large number of people would die of hunger it is at that time india actually appealed to some countries to provide us food grains and some countries indeed provided food grains to india especially us under a program called pl480 some of you would have heard the name pl480 pl480 wheat came to india it was stored in a godown in delhi and believe it or not that godown today is the headquarter of department of science and technology what we call as technology bhavan so g- 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 that came but nonetheless we had to have a long lasting solution a developed country an aspiring developed country cannot remain dependent on foreign things like this and at that time norman borlaug who was working in philippines then had actually developed a dwarf variety of wheat you know the wheat which requires much less resources and gives you good yield of grain or something like that and uh, people like ms swaminathan and uh, Uh, another person whose name uh, i forget right now i think is shivram who was an is officer and of course c subramaniam who was the minister of agriculture they thought that it would be a good idea to start cultivating uh, dwarf wheat in india by then we had also made sure in the early days that there would be sufficient irrigation at least in the north you know we had actually constructed lots of dams and there would be irrigation system for our farming available and c subramaniam then decided to invite borlog to india along with his dwarf wheat and they were actually sent for multi location trials that were conducted by iiri under the leadership of ms swaminathan and uh, eventually they started cultivating this dwarf wheat and once again rest is history today india produces wheat grain in excess much in excess of what we require and in fact today we supply grains to many other countries in the world if this is not science and technology what is science and technology but another thing behind the green revolution was also 
the mechanization of agriculture and at the at that time the use of pesticides you know i mean both these things were important in 1965 how do you do that and the job of mechanizing agriculture we used to actually import tractors from bulgaria and india's foreign exchange situation was very precarious in 1965 that we could no more import tractors from uh, overseas and therefore there was a urgent requirement that we must make tractors in the country and the job was given to the central mechanical engineering research institute in durgapur who also have a branch in ludhiana you know this is a csr institute cmeri and they made the first swaraj tractor it rolled out of a laboratory in 1970 and the swaraj tractor today all of you know swaraj name you have seen swaraj is a brand uh, a few scientists eventually spun off they formed a company the punjab tractors limited they came from csr lab they spun a company out and they became a commercial success in no time just recently about a year ago uh, swaraj tractors has been taken over by mahindra and mahindra at the same time agri pesticides were made in the chemical laboratories of csr so together the irrigation system the cultivation of dwarf wheat mechanization of agriculture and use of pesticides in the early days made green revolution possible you know that's fantastic if westerners tell you that you have not applied science and technology for your people would you believe them we have to actually tell them that thumb on your nose we have done that you know we have lifted so many people out of poverty we have lifted so many people out of hunger and as a remarkable achievement of india science and technology let me give you a second example india's infant death rate you know the children who are born and uh, because of certain things that the mothers would not survive the pregnancy or there would be non lactating mothers was very high in the early days you know so uh, but, uh, we used to have a large number of young kids who would die this infant death rate has dropped quite dramatically since independence today quite dramatic so if anyone says india's health achievement one of the health achievements is uh, that one and one solution for that was actually produce milk in large quantities and of course that actually led to uh, what what is called as the white revolution under the leadership of vargis kurian who had started this uh, uh, movement in gujarat cooperative movement where uh, farmers would actually come and bring the milk but if this milk had to be transported to states like bihar or bengal or something it was impossible we did not have cold storage to transport the milk and the only solution that would be is to convert the milk into powder government of india formed a committee which is called the milk powder committee it was chaired by a person called krishan chand a very famous person or rather infamous person he became very infamous during emergency if you do a google google on krishan chand you will see the emergency excesses of this person he is an is officer uh, this committee suggested that if milk has to be transported efficiently across india we must convert it into milk powder right but the committee had international experts you know people came from scotland people came from new zealand people came from switzerland who would tell us how to convert milk into milk powder because in europe it is possibly done very easily lo and behold the international experts told india that your predominant use of milk is buffalo milk well what we use is cow milk buffalo milk is high in fat and if you try to make this into powder and indeed laboratory trials were made to convert that milk into powder it forms clumps you cannot form uh, milk powder easily and the committee's report says it is impossible for india to convert buffalo milk into powder that's the conclusion cannot do it all right what do we do we have to have a solution so vargis kurian flew down to mysore to a lab called central food technology research institute you know i mean there's a director called subramaniam then so vargis kurian and subramaniam actually decided they are going to hammer this problem out from science and what is the science behind it the chemistry and the biology people would know if there are high fats in a particular solution what you do is actually you centrifuge it at a very high speed right if you do that your fat can actually separate out all right it's not a very uh, rocket science what you are doing and if you separate out the fat try to convert milk into milk powder and that's exactly what happens the milk powder what you see here this dabba actually many of us actually have used this in our childhood you know i mean our mothers uh, used to bring this dabba 
there used to be a csr logo on the top of that and in fact uh, to tell you a small story this when the milk powder used to get over from this our mothers used to store dal in this dabba right and when it caught uh, rust like this then there used to washing powder used to be stored in this so all of us have used this dabba for a long time in our childhood and uh, the solution was very simple separate fat from milk convert the milk into powder what do you do with the fat can you throw it away you make butter out of it and the butter that you eat on your table today is actually made from here right but how do you show that uh, this milk is fit for consumption you also have to show that the powder that you have made is fit for consumption so then csir granted a grant of 10000 rupees to conduct clinical trials in cmc vellore so vargis kurian and subramaniam both of them went to cmc vellore they conducted a proper clinical trial to show that this powder was uh, fit for consumption and once again this entire thing is rest is as we say is history and recently about 6 months ago we celebrated uh, some of the achievements of science and technology and this was actually one of the ones and a former md of uh, amul was called to give a speech and the former md of amul on our uh, zoom call meeting it might be available in the on youtube at one point of time he stopped speaking and he started crying he said this was such a thing that we were told that you cannot do things but all of us got together and we showed the world that we can actually do something that vesanus said that you cannot do it okay this is not deep science and technology you don't need to get nobel prize for every discovery but if that science can be converted for public use and we know how much public use it has it has prevented a large number of infant deaths i would consider it is worth not one nobel prize but multiple nobel prizes because it has had enormous societal impact whether it be agricultural green revolution or white revolution the societal impact they have had is phenomenal listeners today even may not accept this but we should feel extremely proud that we have actually done things which were unthinkable during our 75 years of history and uh, what actually happened because of that is that when covid 19 came in 2020 indian scientific community was confronted that now once again we we'll have to depend on the western powers to develop vaccines to give us diagnostics and to give us many other solutions to mitigate covid-19 but what all of us said together is no we will not do that we will demonstrate to the world that we can tackle covid-19 on our own we knew that western media will come hard on us we knew western media will say that you are not reporting correct we knew that western media will say that you don't have solutions but nonetheless indian scientific science and technology community the entire community you know whether be it iits whether be it national labs whether be it icmr some universities pharmaceutical industry and uh, most importantly the administrative machinery to implement these solutions uh, uh, everywhere rose to the occasion and showed that we also can tackle covid-19 as effectively or rather better than most other countries can do we made our own vaccine we made our own diagnostic kits and we actually were able to show that people in the remotest parts of the world can also be vaccinated using the vaccines that what we had made and it's just amazing how we were able to do that and one example i want to give you is this example in the time that covid-19 was thought to be spread through touch contaminated surfaces we started making noise that covid-19 is not really spread through contaminated surfaces it is spread through airborne particles you know aerosols and it is airborne the virus is essentially airborne if an infected person sneezes that person releases aerosols these aerosols can remain suspended in air for a few hours and any other person inhales those particles can get infected that is the science behind the spread of the disease who did not accept it cdc atlanta did not accept it but eventually this year both of them have come around had said indeed get covid-19 is an airborne disease they have come now but india science and technology community has been saying for last one and a half years not only that we actually came up with a solution if the virus is airborne for example in this room if there is a covid infected person there is a ac which is going on and the air is actually circulated in particular percentage you know fresh air and uh, the air which is circulated there is certain percentage you mix the air it comes back into the room if one person is infected here with covid it takes about 45 minutes to infect everyone in the room 
All right. I mean, there's a calculation that our uh, CFD people, compression fluid dynamics people, they actually made. How do you mitigate this? The simple way of that is that the air before it actually comes into the room, you try to sanitize that particular air. Right? These vents that you see here, these vents, if they are blowing the air in the room, you sanitize that air. And the simple way of sanitization, which is 100 year old solution, is expose that air to ultraviolet light. All right? Not in open place like this, but in the ducts, in the hidden ducts. Okay? Because ultraviolet light also is harmful to humans. And we actually showed that together with places like IIT Kanpur and CSIO Chandigarh, some of the ICMR labs together, we showed that indeed, if you installed UV in the air ducts, it can uh, sanitize the entire air that is coming in. And before one person infected in a room like this would actually infect everyone else, not in 45 minutes, but over a period, about four or five hours. So you can significantly delay that particular period. You know, the calculations showed that. And the first of the solutions we went and installed in both Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha. And recently, all the Vande Bharat Express that you have seen rolling out, all of them in their AC coaches, this solution has been put. So not only COVID, even other airborne infections such as influenza or even TB, which are there, the transmission probability of those in those places where this solution has been implemented would be much lower than otherwise. You know, so this is science behind a particular phenomena, but the technology has been used and deployed in multiple places. For example, IIT Kanpu has uh, deployed this across all the seminar halls and auditoriums and things like that, this particular solution. So this is actually very important that we continue to implement solutions such as this based on certain scientific principles and show to the world that we actually in our thinking are not regressive, but rather we are more progressive than many of the countries that you can actually think of. And as a part of that, we have also issued these building ventilation guidelines that are available on multiple websites, uh, on Niti Aayog and Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs and so on and so forth. Now having done this, I mean, I can go on giving many, many different examples. I can give an example how, how Indian calendar system came to being. I don't know whether you have heard of Indian calendar. All of you have heard of Indian flag, national flag. All of you have heard of national anthem. All of you have heard of national bird. All of you have heard of national animal. So these are called the uh, iconic elements, the national identity elements. There are 16 of them. Have you heard of Indian calendar? So uh, uh, what happened was uh, when we became independent, uh, there are about 30 different calendars which are being used all across the country. And for the same uh, celebration, different people would actually celebrate that particular festival in one part of the country on one day, another part of the country on another day. You know. So the government had difficulties on what actually would be declared as a holiday across the country. And government formed a committee under the chairmanship of Meghnath Saha in 1955 to rationalize all the calendars. And Meghnath Saha committee came up with a rationale saying that the Gregorian calendar that we use has no rational basis. First January is a random date chosen in 365 days and you say that this is the first day. Absolutely no rational basis. It's a belief for a particular sect of people who believe that first January something happened. But we don't have to believe that. So the rational thing would be that how would you define the first day? And Bengnath Saha said that equinox should be the first day. So 21st March should be the first day. 21st March or 21st September or whatever. And then on leap year is 22nd March or something like that. And then national calendar came into being. 1956, government gazetted this and that became one of the national identity elements. We are the only country we have gazetted saying that calendar should be rationalized and should be based on scientific principles. You know, we are the only country in the world who has actually said that. And uh, government immunity, of course, mandates that we should uh, quote both the dates. It's called Saka. I think today we are in Saka 1942 or 43 or something like that. You know, so uh, government of India mandates that we should quote both the dates, but we don't have the habit of doing that. So as I said, we have done a large number of things. And I can go on giving examples of many, many things that we have done based on science and technology. We have implemented into the society and today, even unknowingly, we don't actually see that we are using things which have developed by our scientists and our technologies and have been implemented in the field. Uh, one of my greatest moments in Delhi came when a group of IS officers, about 20 people, we were in a meeting 
एंड समबडी आस्क मी की अरे यार सी एस आर ने क्या क्या बताओ सो जस्ट एट द टाइम द टी वॉज बींग सर्व एंड आई सेट कि ये चाय का तो दूध में पैकेट आता होगा आप दूध उबालते होंगे और चाय में डालते होंगे सो ऑल ऑफ दम लव सेट नहीं 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 हम लोग इसकी पाउडर बना के देते हैं एंड डेट वॉज माई मोमेंट आई सेट नाउ लेट मी टेल यू द मिल्क पाउडर स्टोरी एंड आई नरेटेड द एंटायर स्टोरी सो इवन द आई एस ऑफिसर्स यू नो मीन द हाइस्ट लेवल ऑफ एडमिनिस्ट्री ऑफिसर इन द कंट्री आर नॉट अवेयर ऑफ इंडिया साइंस एंड टेक्नोलॉजी अचीवमेंट्स इज अमेजिंग यू नो नो विद दिस वॉट वी आर सेट टूडे अवर एस्पिरेशन नाउ और फॉर द एंटायर ह्यूमैनिटी we don't want to actually distinguish west versus east or india or something we know that humanity has very pressing problems that we are confronting and we want to actually solve them some problems are local some problems are global and some of the local problems for example is the water uh, availability in the coming time you see here the water availability in 1950 was great but we are very rapidly moving towards a water scarce nation by 2050 and this rampant use of ground water in the country and so on so forth and this actually is going to have enormous impact on much of our lives in another 20 30 years so we must actually come up with rational solutions how we are going to recharge ground water on today's date ground water is recharged by having some pits in random places and we hope that having those pits sand pits actually can recharge ground water i think the rational way of going is that you should match underground channels underground lakes and try to recharge actually those and the technique for doing that and what we have demonstrated near a village uh, in a village near hyderabad called chotupal is map underground resources by electromagnetic sensors this is not very difficult to do and then find out what are the aquifers which exist and recharge those aquifers you know there are large channels that exist below the surface of the earth and here this is a village which had become semi arid in 2015 the village kids had started moving out of the village and we went and told them we mapped the entire subsurface region in the village and showed them at one particular time if they start storing water it will seep through the ground and recharge your ground water in 2021 what you see on their other side the village is now cultivating paddy the most water intensive crop by simple experiment like this by showing where the aquifers exist in uh, underground and if you recharge them once again water supply actually can become plenty so the judicial use of water recycling and water use can actually lead to uh, get over the problem that what you actually uh, saw there so this is a very fantastic example what we have done recently is we have mapped entire rajasthan so north of gujarat rajasthan and south of haryana is what we have mapped using this technique and we have given this to ministry of jal shakti uh, about a few months ago saying that if you actually generate water recharging at particular places even rajasthan can start growing hopefully one day paddy as an agricultural crop we also have a, uh, can be aware that uh, fossil fuels are not going to be with us all the time and one of the thing that we have demonstrated recently is the biojet fuel that is made from agri residues and so on so forth and india only became second country in the world in which we are able to fly aeroplanes on uh, biofuels made with indigenous flights and what you see here are the an32 aircrafts which flew on 26 january last year in the parade and they actually flew on the biojet fuel that was made in the country and mangalore refinery now the mangalore refinery that has taken up the task of scaling it up and they making biojet fuel at a very large scale not only that multiple airlines have now signed mou with the indian institute of petroleum uh, so that uh, biojet fuels can be made and not multiple airlines alone believe it or not in march this year boeing came to india and said that we want to sign mou with you to make biojet fuel for the next generation now this is a great moment of pride for all of us that a company like boeing actually recognizes that we are ahead of the world and they have something to exploit from our achievements of science and technology so this actually is going extremely well to summarize actually what i want to tell you is that the myth that british had perpetuated that india did not have science and technology indians did not have rational thinking power is an absolute nonsense we always have been a society we have not only been affluent but our, our affluence was based on multiple factors right we had made seaports for example in lothal 5000 years ago and lothal was actually an important point of trade between far east and middle east right 
Lothal actually was a very important thing. Now this could not have been made without the applications of science and technology. We wrote treatises like uh, Charak Sahita or uh, Bhaskaracharya's Bijaganita long ago, thousand years ago, we actually wrote these uh, treatises. They're used even today, some of those principles. So we have witnessed progress in science and technology in every possible aspect. The 200 years of what Shashitiru calls as dark ages was blackened because we are systematically suppressed and our creativity actually could not be really flourished at that particular point of time. And therefore, the myth that British perpetuated has to be debunked at all levels. So although we miss the fruits of the first industrial revolution in the mid 19th century, uh, our emphasis post-independence has been on science and technology. And the fourth revolution that is coming up, what all of us know as the industry 4.0 or whatever, it is our job to make sure that we don't miss that particular revolution. And as we continue our journey, our focus has to be on future of humanity, not only for our own people in this country, but for entire humanity and that of our planet. You know, so India's lessons to the world have always been human centric for entire humanity. We have never discriminated between uh, discrimination between the color of the skin or the language that you speak or which geography you belong. We have always been a very inclusive society through the history. And we must actually focus on humanity and its benefit and make sure that our scientists and our technologies work towards the betterment of this humanity in the future. Thank you all very much for your attention. So we, we can have an interaction here. Uh, we can take one or two questions from the audience. No, no, no. So water recycling, what we have done is we map subsurface structures, essentially aquifers, using electromagnetic sensors. And wherever aquifers present, and we can find that water can seep through to recharge that water, we actually promote water recharging of those places. And I mean, groundwater recharging is a problem all over the country. And many actually cities now have made compulsory for new residential areas come up, which uh, recharge groundwater. But instead of doing that indiscriminately, what we are saying is that we should do it based on the subsurface structures. That's all. It is not metal or plastic based per se. Natural calamities will always happen. I don't think we can prevent any of the natural calamities. Infectious diseases like COVID-19 is not the last of the viruses that we have seen. In fact, it was waiting for last several years. Most of the public health experts had said that the next emergency of public health is around the corner. For the last about 25, 30 years, we have been saying that uh, it came in the form of COVID-19 and we found ourselves to be least prepared for that. But I think the largest calamity that we are facing right now is that of climate change. And that everyone recognizes around the world. That is real calamity around the world. And uh, we must all work collectively to impress political leadership and general public that this is the calamity that is avoidable if we are, uh, and the calamity is because of anthropogenic effects. And without anthropogenic effects, this calamity would not have been there. So it's our duty to actually impress upon them. So calamities will always happen. Floods, uh, rare events of uh, rainfalls, cyclones, extreme summers. These things are going to happen and we have to be prepared for them.
Thank you, sir. This is Rajesh from physics department here. Uh, thank you for enlightening us on this. Uh, my question or your, I, uh, your opinion, <coughs> I would request on, we all uh, use journals for uh, publishing things and uh, most of the times that's uh, used as uh, one of the uh, progress uh, landmarks. Of course, CSIR has some uh, journals, but they are not uh, very recognized. So do you think that is something which we need to work right now? And uh, is Vibha doing something, Vigyan Bharti doing something on these so that we have a journal, India-based, which can be recognized for all uh, assessments and etc. Your opinion on this, please. Yes, the, indeed the problem, what you say is very true, that there is a need to improve the quality of Indian journals. Some of the journals have also been founded by none other than C.V. Raman. I think Indian Journal of Physics was founded, right? Or Pramana, one of the two. Was founded by, yeah, that was founded by C.V. Raman. Uh, over a period of time, the quality of the journals has gone down, uh, including the CSI journals. What Vibha is doing, Vibha's mandate is not actually to get into the nitty gritties of what scientists do and what they don't. Our job essentially is to take science and especially achievements of Indian scientists to the public. Even today, what Indian scientists are doing, their achievements, if we are able to take to the public, the public will become aware that there is a community which is working tirelessly for the betterment of society and advancement of knowledge in general. Now, when I was in CSIR, we actually started initiative to improve the quality of journals. And uh, the, the Journal of Physics of uh, CSIR, uh, that uh, we have reconstituted uh, uh, editorial board. I believe Jiu Kulkarni was, is on campus today. So if you ask Jiu Kulkarni, uh, he, I think he must be around. He has come for the fist meeting, I'm told. Uh, so JNCA, sir. Uh, so he's the editor in chief. Ask him what actually is happening to that particular effort. And if he has not done anything, grill him. So. <laughs> Uh, what advice you would give to young researchers and you know, young professors? Our institute is very young. <laughs> we are in teens, 13 years, <laughs> as he has been found out. I mean, he has mentioned last time when he came here. So what advice you would give to us in, in, form, in the form of what directions of research we should take or in general, whatever? Uh, actually, it's very difficult to get advices, but uh, uh, the time that I spent in Delhi actually has spoiled me, and I have been giving advices even on the areas that I am not expert in. You know, so <laughs> that's how all the bureaucrats work in Delhi. You know, so it's quite remarkable. Uh, but uh, what like, let me tell you, yesterday we had a fantastic talk by somebody called Professor Richard Roberts, uh, who won Nobel Prize in 1993, and he had come to Pune. And he gave a talk uh, in the institute where I work, National Center for Cell Science and the uh, Pune University, what is called as Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University. So they had jointly organized this talk. And he was talking of the importance of recognizing accidents and failures in life. And he actually said that chance plays a very major role in everybody shaping everybody's future. But the chance at that particular time, if you analyze that particular chance and take the correct rational step that can actually help you in overcoming difficulties for future or something. And he asked me whether have you ever deliberated on all the chances that you have taken in your life and what could have happened if you have not done this and that. And I said, indeed, some of us do. I don't know many people do or not. And in every point of time, we take decisions in our life to do this or to not to do this actually can shape over the, what the things which are coming in future. And he said that if you are prepared and if you are prepared to accept failures and ask a question that why did you fail on a particular thing, you know, then there's a good chance that you would succeed in his career. And he actually described how he won the Nobel Prize and how he made the discovery, including the fact that he wanted to be a snooker player at one point of time, he said. And he said, I would have been a snooker champion by now, I would have been a celebrity. And uh, then he decided to do science. And uh, of course, like this. And then uh, in the lab, what he experienced, he did. Uh, he discovered something called, at that time, splicing of genes. So the biologists here will know introns and exons and all. That was his discovery. And how he discovered that by chance. And he said that most of the scientific discoveries have happened by serendipity. 
but serendipity also because you have failed in doing experiments that what you have done. So the advice to the young people, what he gave, and I'm just reiterating his words, I'm not good in giving advices, is that be prepared for those chances. And when you fail, ask a question to yourself why you have failed, and possibly actually you may get a very deep answer in your failures. You know, so if you do that, probably you'll be better prepared for the future is what he said. But I'm sorry, I don't have any deeper advice than this. Well, thank you, Mandya, sir. Any question? Okay. Uh, thank you, Mandya, sir, for sharing your views on 75 years of Indian scientific journey. Uh, I'm sorry here to update you that our next speaker, uh, Padam Sri Sri S.P. Bhojaji, is not feeling well. Uh, he's still in the guest house of the campus. So, but the title was basically contribution of Dr. Homi Jagir Baba in nation building. So at least we need to get some light on this topic. So now I request uh, Dr. Sanjay Chokse. He's the head of superconducting cavities development division, RR Cat Hindor, to at least give some ideas about SR discussion. Chokse ji, please. Thanks, organizers. Monday, sir. Joshi, sir. Nakhe, sir, our director. Actually, <clears throat> I am giving a small talk on behalf of uh, Bhojeji, who was actually our first boss when I joined uh, Kalpakkam after my officer batch training at BRC in 1989. And till 95, I was there. And uh, <clears throat> Bhojeji was our group director that time and subsequently he became director of the center in 2000. And uh, <clears throat> so, so I was slightly nervous to give the talk uh, of fast beta reactor on behalf of Bhoji ji because Bhoji ji and uh, his boss uh, uh, Paranjpesa was the pillar of fast beta program because uh, when uh, uh, Bhava was there, actually in early 50s itself, uh, the fast beta reactor program came to world and India actually had first fast beta reactor started in 1970 at Kalpakkam and uh, that is a site near Chennai and is the biggest uh, nuclear city of our country because that is the only place in uh, India which have all nuclear reactions at one place. Nowhere in the world will find the reactor technology of all nuclear reactions at one place. So, <clears throat> this is uh, what is structure of atom. But, uh, I will not go detail because I think uh, Bhoji ji has prepared uh, more on this. But this is the famous uh, equation. Actually, natural uranium, we have only 0.7% uh, uranium U-235 as one isotope. And uh, with one fission, we get something like 200 MeV of the energy and uh, radioisotopes. And uh, because we need energy from this, this uh, have another, this is actually fissionable material, but you have 99.3% uranium U-233 in natural uranium. Initially, we have mines of natural uranium at uh, Jadugola, Bihar, and from where the first uh, natural, so because when Bhava came to India, he started our nuclear program. Initially, the first uh, thermal power reactors in uh, re uh, this thing is at Raut Bata. And we purchased one reactors when Bhava was there, G at Tarapur. Maybe knowing one nuclear city, Tarapur near Mumbai. So the Bhava vision was very clear. Bhava at very young age, 
could see the nuclear program in the form of thermal reactors as well as this thing and he laid the foundation of fast beta reactor also in the country and three stage program so i will just go through what is the three stage program this thing but uh, this uh, will give that uh, in one uh, fission we have 200 mev of the energy and uh, with this actually we calculate the critical mass and the energy of any reactor so these are the fission product and uh, <clears throat> So in uh, U-235, which is a fissile material, and U-239 as uh, fertile material. Finally, because of this, uh, this U-238 absorb the neutron and convert into plutonium. And uh, this plutonium otherwise is not cannot be used other than uh, other applications. So what happened? It was thought that why we cannot convert breed this uranium uh, converted plutonium. into next stage of program and that is basically from fast neutron this plutonium is taken and goes to the another second stage of program where the combination of this uh ha ah, sir sir yes. no 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 please please come please come so i just started because uh, bhoje sir has come Sir, your thing is gone. Some kind of joke. I will. I will play this thing. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah. uh, I will. Watch. yeah dr bhoje is former director of indira gandhi center for uh... yes 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 so uh, sorry actually uh, now i request uh, joshi sir to just introduce our speaker so it's our pleasure to welcome uh, dr bhoje uh, uh he's he was suddenly not feeling well just before the program and uh, we were wondering what to do but uh, thanks to his spirit <laughs> that he, were, he went to hospital and he has taken some treatment and the moment he felt better he thought he should come here thank you very much for coming uh, dr bhoje was a distinguished scientist at uh, department of atomic energy worked there for 40 years uh, he has done his mechanical engineering bachelor in mechanical engineering in 1965 from college of engineering pune and uh, uh, he has been there as a uh, he completed one year of training of nuclear science and engineering at bhava atomic research center and joined as a scientific officer at prc bombay <clears throat> uh, there are many awards i think the prominent being he received padma shri from government of india in 2003 for all his contribution to the uh, you know nuclear program Uh, without much uh, delay i would request uh, dr bhoje to uh, you know share his thoughts and uh, you know his association with uh, uh, homi bhava thank you very thank much thank you ah uh, yeah, yeah okay tumhala gana uh, okay pehla wala you go to the first one yeah first of all i am very sorry suddenly i had a pain in the abdomen and because of the kidney stone it was pain very much 
So doctor said that you wait for half an hour, we'll take it out. Urine will be taken out and we'll come. So I was worried whether we cancel the program or we can have it tomorrow on that one. So first again, sorry. Second is, this is my second visit to Indore. Earlier I visited to CAT uh, here, here. So I'd like to congratulate all the Indoreans for the sixth uh, consecutive award of Clean City in India. So that is an excellent thing which is you know, if you want to say something to the, the nation, not to the government, what should be the aim of our uh, progress to be made or how to build it? So I would say make every city like Indore. That would be the best thing to do it here so that we have very ideal things. Second point to that you are uh, within the 20 uh, 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 cities, smart cities, which has been taken and further it will be improving now. So you are not only clean, but you are smart people. And the third is the Indoor is an educational hub here. You got IIT, you got IIM, you got many engineering colleges and other colleges which are here. So you people are intelligent people. <laughs> So you are clean, smart, and intelligent. So this is how the progress we should make it here for every city. Well, today I'll talk on uh, hospital reactor program of our country. Now, you know the name fast breeder reactor. So I'll give you a little bit of physics of it, which you will learn probably in the college days or, or your even schools also. And then we'll give it what has happened and what, what is to be done. So this is the structure of the atom. Oh, sorry. This is the structure of the atom, which you know that in the center there is a nucleus which contains neutrons and protons. And surrounding that are the electrons which move. So this is every atom consists like this one, except in hydrogen, where there is no proton, a neutron there, only one hydrogen, one proton and one electron which is there on that. So this is how the structure of the other thing is that first one is hydrogen, second one is helium, two protons, two neutrons, then lithium. And then what we have got the heaviest element which is available in the nature is uranium, which has got 92 protons. 235 minus 92 will be the number of neutrons. And 92 electrons will be moving around the cup. So it becomes a very complex structure which is of that. Now what happens is as the atom becomes heavier and heavier and heavier, it becomes unstable. We cannot have anything in the nature heavier than uranium. So this is the heaviest element which is there. And this uranium, after that one, you just, and then they, in the uranium, there are two isotopes. We go, yeah, now this is just a, no, hydrogen atom, helium atom, and uranium atom, how the, Schematically, this is shown there. Now, uranium contains two isotopes. One is uranium-235 and uranium-238. Now, 235 atom easily splits into two if we can hit with the neutron. And the other is uranium-238, which doesn't go under undergo fission, even if you hit with any low, particularly low, uh, low uh, neutron, low energy neutrons, which is here. So these two isotopes, so 235 fissions, which is shown over here. Now this fission, uh, 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 what you call, uh, 
discovery was done in 1939 by the German scientist. And then the nuclear energy had gone into many for peaceful purposes, for non-peaceful purposes, it was had gone there. Now, when a neutron is hit there from external, sorry. Sir, I will do. Huh? No, you can reuse. Yeah, you go. You go back. Go back. Back, back. Hmm. Ah, now this is the uranium-235 atom which undergoes fission. So there is a neutron which hits there. After hitting the neutron, it splits there. And there are krypton and barium. These are the two atoms which are formed. So the people were surprised at how these new elements have come into uranium. And then they started thinking on that one. And then they proved that barium and then uh, krypton atoms which are there. They are coming from uranium-235. So these are the two products. They are radioactive materials. So they are harmful to the, if you, it is in a higher doses if you get there. And then we get neutrons, two to three neutrons come out. Three are shown neutrons there. They come out along with that. And there is a 200 million electron volt energy is released. Now 200 million electron volt, if you compare it, suppose you take carbon, and you burn carbon, carbon plus oxygen equal to CO2. And it gives five electron volt, five electron volt as the energy output. Whereas here, 200 million electron volts. So you can see the amount of energy which comes out of the fissioning is very, very large. And this energy is used, in, first of all, it was used for the for making the bombs and then we are using it now for production of electricity. So that is one is peaceful purposes, one is for the destruction purposes. Next. Yeah, now here nuclear fission, how the how it is come? That is the uranium-235 atom, energy is coming out, neutrons have come out, two fission products are formed there. So this is just an animation of the fission, nuclear fission which is there. Next one. Now this, it is not only fission, that is very important, but fission continues. And that is why the energy can come out of the things. Now this is called a chain reaction. You just, uh, that one neutron which is there, I think on this one, it, no animation will be possible. So that neutron comes, no, you go back. Uh, so that chain reaction, that neutron comes and hit one uranium-235 atom. Then there are neutrons which come out. Those neutrons hit the other atoms. Those atoms again fall and then I fall. So it is like a continuous chain reaction which can take place over there if sufficient quantity of uranium-235 is present there. So this is how the energy which comes out. Now this fission reaction, it it takes place in the order of 10 to the power minus 14 second. That much short time it fissions out. So the energy given out is very large, even if you take all the chain reaction. So particularly you know, the, the bombs and all that thing, the energy is very huge and it comes out less than second time, even much less than that. And if you want to take out this energy in a useful manner, we want to take it out. We control the fission chain reaction. To give you an example, if you take petrol, you take a barrel of petrol and put a fire into it. What will happen there? It will be explosion. You cannot make use of that energy which is there. That is what happens also in the nuclear bomb. The second is, Take that petrol, suppose, for example, take in your car, you are putting into the tank. From the tank, you take it to the engine, drop by drop, and you control the. So the same petrol gives you car, which is for driving, you will have it here, and you control it by accelerator and all that. So that is called a peaceful use of at nuclear energy. And the other is destructive use of the 
nuclear energy, which is so. When this was oh, oh, discovered, all that thing, the scientists and all that thing, they started using it here. When this can be used for making bomb, and then it was discovered in Germany, so the Hitler will be able to make the bomb earlier to them. You know, all the uh, which is pro probably today the NATO countries which are there. So they he they started worried here, and then many of the scientists like Niels Bohr, or the Enrico Fermi or Einstein, they all migrated to United States, which is there, and then they started thinking of that. Then they wrote a letter about Eisenhower how energy can be made there as well. So they started making it here at the Oak Ridge National Laboratory, and they made uranium two thirty five in large quantities. Even you know they had come here in our Kerala, one of that beach is there, but there you find more thorium. So they didn't take anything; they went away there. So from all over the places they collected all the uranium. Now uranium two thirty five is point seven percent only, but for making atom bomb you need ninety five more than ninety five percent of uranium two thirty five. So this process of increasing uranium two thirty five is called enrichment, and this enrichment. Is done for making weapons. For peaceful uses, you have three to five percent of the uranium two thirty five. If you need to increase it here, but we have it. We can take it out from the natural thing, which will go, we, I'll show you to you on the how the natural uranium can be used as other thing. Next one. Now this is how the natural uranium two thirty five, ninety two protons, one forty three neutrons, and fissile. Then 238 has got 92 protons, 146 fertile. So that is the proportion which is there. So the nature has given you something which is very small. And the discovery was with the uranium 235 when about the fissioning of that. So this is the natural uranium, and we increase that 0.7% to 35 as increasing percentage goes. Then we call that process as enrichment. Next. Now, as I told you that you take out the energy from the fissioning of this one in a step by step process. Which, for example, there are types of reactor. As I told you about the car, you got many types of cars are there. You know, brands, each company which is in. So similarly, many of these nations and the uh, this one, for example, General Electric in USA. Or the Westinghouse in USA. So these are the companies which make use of the ideas of the fission and taking out the energy in a controlled manner. So that device is called the reactor, nuclear reactor. So this nuclear reactor, when we make it here, there are different types, like made different cars are there, you know, models which are there. So in this one, one is depending on the thermal energy. It is called thermal neutrons. That is, neutrons which are born in the fission are very fast. They go something like twenty thousand kilometers per second. And that fissioning of the next uh, uranium two thirty five does not take place fast because it moves very fast. It doesn't spend much time in the vicinity of the uranium two thirty five. Then, those energy is reduced. To something like twenty kilometers per second. So when it goes more, takes more time. There is a probability of interaction of that neutron with the uranium two thirty five is more. So it fissions. So we call it fission cross section. That means probability of fission is more there other thing. And that type of reactor is called thermal reactor. The second reactor is called fast reactor, where the neutrons as born. Fast, which are there very fast, so they are being used of fissioning. Now, what are the advantage of thermal reactor? Is to reduce to is the reduce of reduction of energy. It gives you more probability of reaction. In fast builder reactor, the probability decreases because it is fast there. But what is done that more number of atoms are put there in that, so that the probability of number of neutrons and the probability of Fissioning, both again remain high, like thermal reactor. So, in thermal reactors, we can use natural uranium as we are using it in the Haywater reactor, which will be explained. Then, LeU is 
low enriched uranium. This is used in the boiling water reactor or pressurized water reactor. In that process, they are used there. And then in fast reactor, you use plutonium. You need to have plutonium because you cannot use natural uranium. And when you use, when you put enriched uranium, the number of neutrons which uranium gives out and the number of plutonium which uranium, sorry, neutrons which are given by plutonium, the number is more. So that is why the fast reactor, it breeds. It is called fast breeder reactor. So fission is caused by fission and breed means it generates more plutonium again and gives you electricity. So this is the beauty of the, the fast breeder reactor which is there given. So you can see the LMFBR, liquid metal fast breeder reactor in which sodium or lead is used. And then moderator is used in the thermal reactor. Either you use light water, heavy water or graphite. Now the graphite reactors are no more used there because of Chernobyl type of accident. It is uh, you know dangerous to have it. So graphite is gone there. It is light water and heavy water. These are two reactors which are in use now. And in fast metal reactor, it is sodium cooled liquid metal fast metal reactor. And Russians are using lead for their submarine reactors. Uh, submarine. So there you, you can you see therm thermal neutrons, there are R and D purposes, power process heat, plutonium production, which is used, LEU, and propulsion ship, submarine, rocket, which they can be used in addition to the reactor, which is here. So this is how the whole spectrum of the which is there. So these like different types of cars which are there, which have different types of reactors. Next. Now in fast breeder reactor, fission is caused by neutrons with high energy. Due to the fascination, more number of neutrons are released in the fission. For example, 2.92 against 2.5 in thermal reactor. So that 0.4 is an extra number of neutrons which is absorbed again in plutonium. So it gives you breeding. And then all the nuclear reactions have low probability, as I told you. Sigma is the probability, sigma fission, absorption, scattering, nilx scattering of two orders are magnitude lower in the fast filter reactor, which is here. Next. Now this is just a neutron energy, which is go, the number of neutrons which are released out is given out there. But you see at two, when two neutrons are given, one goes for next fission and one remains you for breeding. So they reduce that absorption of that neutron so that you get more number of plutonium, which is here. So you see over in thermal reactor, it is just a two. So if you take absorption, all that thing is there and you go to the fast neutrons, for example, 10 to the power six or 10 to the power seven, you see the number of neutrons are the order of three to five, three to four. And those extra neutrons are used for absor absorption in uranium-238 and it breeds. Next. This is yeah, just, go ahead. Go ahead. Next. Yeah. Now you see here what happens. I'll give you an example. If a couple has got two children, or less than two children, then the population will decrease. But if the number of children are more than two, then they breed. That population goes on increasing. So in a similar fashion over here, what is plotted here is the breeding ratio or the conversion ratio. And on the top side, you got fuel utilization. That is suppose, for example, uranium-235, we have got 0.7% uranium-238 is there. So the 238 and 235, how much percentage we use it, that fraction expressed in percentage is called the fuel utilization factor. Now you see over here, the moment you touch one, the breeding ratio is one, after subtracting one for the fission one, you see the utilization factor goes up very high. And it goes up and total today, as today's technology, it is something like 80 percent, 80 times uranium-235 is used for production of electricity. So 
the, the the use of breeding is done in increasing the capacity of the uranium thirtieth. So most of the natural uranium which was there, we use it here for production purposes. And you see there that the vertical side, two horizontal lines are shown there. There the burn up. That means how much energy you take it out. The more the energy you take it out, the more utilization you will do it here. So that is how there. And today the technology has been gone there. It goes up to 90% of the uranium which goes there. And you see on the conversion ratio side, you got the light water reactor. Then you got heavy water reactor, and then you got the gas reactor, high temperature gas product. You see, they are less than one. When less than one, utilization is not good. So the, that uranium utilization, you see, 0.5 to 0 0.8, 0 0.9 maximum. So it is called a converter reactor, and if you use that only, you will go on decreasing the amount of material fission which goes undergoes so it is not a breeder reactor and if it is the moment it goes one and slightly higher because some losses takes place in the process we get it very high energy so this is the uh, diagrammically shown utilization of uranium as a function of conversion or building ratio so you should must aim in the reactor something like 1.1 or 1.05 then beyond that is all to get energy. Uh, so the uh, uh, utilization of uranium to 35 is becomes very high. Next. You see now what, what is shown over here is without fast reactor. The top disk is without this one, which has got coal in the world. If all that coal is burned there, you get billion tons of oil equivalent. You know, all the energies are converted into oil equivalent. And you see that uranium to 33, which is there, that is, if you use it in thermal reactor, only three, you get 33 billion tons of oil equivalent, which is there. And then you've got gas 126, and then you've got oil 138. And so you can see coal is a high, higher than gas and oil are similar, and uranium to 33 is very small quantity of. So the nuclear energy will be just a passing phase. You cannot use it for a very, very long time. And if you want to use it here, you will have. Now you see that same amount of uranium. When we convert uranium 238 to plutonium, we get the energy below is with fast water reactor, 2000 figure. So that much is the energy from 33, it goes to 2000. So it is an enormous amount of energy which comes out. And <coughs> And you see the gas, oil, and coal. They are same quantities, 517, at the top. But proportionately, if you do there, they are very small. So compared to those uh, uh, energy resources, the uranium resource becomes huge. And then one can use thorium into this. Again, energy resource becomes very good. So this is what they call is energy security to the, any country which has got a small amount of uranium also can convert if the technology of fast water reactor is mastered. Next one. To achieve criticality in fast water reactor, you need enrichment. 4% of uranium-235 in PWR, pressurized water reactor, compared to 20% in fast reactor. So you need to either uranium-235 or plutonium-239. Next, the thermal, uh, sorry, the neutron flux in the fast water reactors are very high. That is the number of neutrons passing through per, you know, a cubic centimeter of this one is of this order. It's one order magnitude more in case of the fast reactor, which is it. Next. So no moderator is used. Sodium is used coolant because water cannot be used once you have water. So sodium is a coolant which is used there. It is a very good thermal properties. Plus, it melts at 98 degree centigrade and boils at 882 degree centigrade. That means, in order to get high temperature, as in case of a, you take a coal fired boilers, you use very high pressure, high temperature which is used there. You need to pressurize that water, which goes through the reactor. Whereas, we don't need pressurization. Pressure is practically atmospheric pressure. 
so it is used and then you convert the in this one but sodium is rea chemically reactive with water so you cannot use it indirectly you put it in the steam generator and in the steam generator you put the generate the steam and use that steam to a turbine turbine and beyond that is conventional turbine is there then you got a generator then transformer and then it goes to the grid that is how the process which is here on that one we will see the flow sheet over here next uh, so sodium you have to use stainless steel ordinary steel cannot be used over there because of the corrosion behavior which is there and the first fast burner reactor was built in 1946 in usa and that is called clementine because people when they physicists calculated all this number of neutrons and the reaction which are there they wanted to see whether it builds really so they built this is a small reactor it is in watts power was only in watts and mercury was used as a coolant there and they found out that yes it does breed and other thing and that was the confirmation of that and the first electricity was generated in 1951 from a fast builder reactor not in a thermal reactor and then after usa then U ussr uk france germany japan and india these countries followed this one so it is only six countries which developed this technology next one so this is the experimental builder reactor in usa which used for showing that building plus it generated electricity the electricity was very small it is about 200 200 watts only a few bulbs or sub only it can burn but that was the first demonstration of the whole engineering of the fission process to electricity next now this uh you you got uh, see conversion of uranium to 30 plutonium is more in fast burner reactor than in thermal reactor due to more number of neutrons released in fast reactor and less absorption in the structure and coolant and then the core of the size is fast reactor is very small compared to large let us say about five meters here compared to one meter here in this next now this is these two reactions are very important reactions the first one i told you uranium 238 neutron plus it absorbs one neutrons so three out of three neutrons or 2.5 neutrons one goes in absorption of uranium 38 uranium 238 becomes uranium 239 and uranium 239 is not fissionable and its half life is only 23.5 minutes so in a very short time uranium 239 gets converted to neptune 239 neptune is again man made element in this one and that neptunium is not fissionable with ordinary neutrons so that undergoes decay radioactive decay in 2.35 days that means again a short period and it emits one beta rays and it becomes plutonium 239 and plutonium 239 is a fissionable material plus it remains for 24,000 years so its half life is very long so a useful material in a short time gets converted and remains at that in that conversion for a long time so we can use it we can fabricate the fuel we can put in the reactor burn it here or other so this is the first important reaction which is here the second important reaction is thorium which is the next nuclear material which is there i put it but thorium does not has got only one isotope like uranium 2 isotopes are there here it is got only one isotope and it doesn't undergo fission but what you do you convert thorium by bombarding one neutron into that it becomes 92 thorium in 23.3 minutes which get converted to paractinium in 27 days beta and then becomes uranium 233 92 uranium 233 is a fissile material it is again a man made isotope like natural uranium is available in 235 man made plutonium 239 is man made and then uranium 233 is made so unless you put thorium which is here but thorium adds up now when you got plenty of uranium we don't go to thorium now so thorium will be used maybe another 100 years or something when all the uranium 238 is consumed 
So the conversion of fuel of with uranium to 38 to plutonium is better than thorium to uranium 30. That is how the first reaction is used. The second reaction will take, of course, experiments and other things are, are done in small quantities production, finding out the physics properties and all that is done there, but is not used in any reactor, which is next. Now, you know, okay, you know, Enrico Fermi, who first made a self sustaining chain reaction in the USA in a reactor called CP2, that is, that is the name which was given there. And they did experiments with that experiment. The country which first develops a breeder reactor will have a great computing advantage in atomic energy. Now, this was said by him in 1942 because of the conversion which is there. And that time, uranium-238, uranium, uranium in the nature available is very small. So it will get consumed. And then you go to 238 so that you use it. That is why you the first country, country which produces first middle reactor has got advantages. But there are now problems which are there. I will, we will come there next. Now, refueling is done in the shutdown condition that is there. The pre level of sodium is used because sodium we don't need pressurization. So it is in the tank. It is put like, you know, in a utensil, you put water or milk and then remains at that temperature. So that is called the free circuit level. And then go to the next. Now, you know, when this development was going on, uh, you know, Kennedy who was the president of USA had put two technological challenges for USA. He told all the technical scientists and technical thing. That is first landing of moon, landing of man and the moon before 1970. And this happened, you know, in 1969, July, Neil Armstrong landed onto that. And the second goal will be commercialization of breeder reactor by 1980. This was happened. So the first happened, but the second one has not yet happened. It is built, but then we will see it here. So it could not go to commercialization stage. Now, in spite of early stuff, R&D on FBR, the commercialization is delayed due to falling. Next. Decrease in thermal reactor program because energy growth was reduced there due to reduced growth in the demand of electricity in the developed countries. If nuclear energy catches cold, the breeder reactor will have pneumonia. That means if nuclear energy is not taking breeder which is there, it will be having pneumonia. That means it will have. Then too much of uranium is there in the earth. More and more, more and more found out. For example, in India, we in 1960, 70s, that time, we got 50,000 tons of uranium. And today we have got 2 lakhs ton of uranium. So we install more capacity, pressurized water reactor, and we prolong it for a very long time. Now the concern for nuclear weapons is first thing was there. And the, uh, uh, you know, the president, US president, next president, what is his name, I don't get to that, Jimmy Carter. So he said, if you, got, if you want to make a bomb, you need 10 to 15 kilograms of plutonium. So you, you, you are producing in tons in a fast builder reactor. And so there will be a proliferation of nuclear weapons. And that is why we should not build thermal reactor. So he stopped the tech, this one in the USA. Nobody, so that other countries also will not do it here. But that did not happen. So not, so Jimmy Carter stopped or killed the clinch river builder reactor, reactor which was under construction. And he told other countries not to you go to fast filter. Next. Now uh, we'll go the heat transfer, other thing. But you see the property sodium melts at 98.4 degrees centigrade and boils at 844 at, at atmospheric pressure. Therefore, high coolant outlet temperature is possible and thereby the efficiency, thermal efficiency is there without pressurization. And this limit comes out the material. Therefore, stainless steel is there, use it, use it, use it higher and higher temperature. Next. Now, these are two types of reactors. One is called pool type, another is called a loop type. 
depends on how the, you arrange those components in the reactor. So this is engineering of that one. Next. Now there is our properties of sodium. How it is there? Sodium one bad property, it is opaque. You cannot see through that. Whereas water, through that you can see there. So when you shut down the reactor, you can see what is happened in the reactor. So it is a transparent there. You put a camera inside, you take it out, it's very easy. But in sodium, you cannot see that. So people are using ultrasonic cameras. The ultrasonic waves, they pass it there to the, they get it reflected from the body, which you want to see. And then that is used for the inspection. So you need a special technique for uh, this one over there. And then the CP and specific heat and density and other things are given. Density is 0.88, whereas water is 730. So it is, uh, in the sodium, it is density, you can see over here, slightly higher than the water. Next. So go ahead. Go ahead. Now you just go back one. Uh, now fast filter reactors are more complex. First, you need a primary circuit, then a secondary circuit, then steam generator. And then you go to generation of steam and then turbine. So beyond steam generator, both things are same. But in fast filter, you get higher temperature. So the efficiency is higher, but about 40% compared to about 32% in the thermal reactors. Now, very high fuel burn up is possible. That means you burn it. When you put in the reactor, you take it out after say one year, two year, three years. So this is called a burn up. So this burn up is very high in, in the fast filter reactor. You know, if, if you take the 60 gigawatts was there compared to pressurized water of seven reactor. And this reduces the fuel cycle cost. Next. Then the capital cost of the first reactor is more because you got primary circuit, you got secondary circuit, then you have to use sodium and stainless steel also. So these are the figures which are coming there. BN600 in Russia, 1.6 times. Super Phoenix 1200 megawatt, which was built reactor. The cost was 2.2. Monju reactor, which was built by Japanese, cost was six times higher. So, and BN600 is construction now, and it was 1.2 there. So, you have brought down. So, the people have said, unless you reduce the cost of energy, you cannot use that type of energy resource, which is here on that. Now, this is hospital test reactor at Kalpakam. We've got the primary circuit, vessel. Then we've got the intermediate heat exchanger. You got sodium pump. Then that yellow one is the secondary sodium. We use secondary sodium in pump and steam generator. And in the steam, the steam is generated at 480 degrees, 125 bar pressure. And then it goes to the turbine. Then it goes to the condenser. And then again, through that circuit, it comes back. Either you have got a cooling tower or one through. And then the generated electricity goes through to the grid. So this is schematically flow sheet of the fast reactor. Next. Now the main characteristics are MBTR, which we are now running, 40 megawatt, 13 megawatt electrical. Many of the countries, they don't produce electricity, but we have said that we'll get experience of steam generator and everything. So we have added a turbine, so 30, uh, this one loop is there. The number of primary and sodium R loops are two. The fuel which is used in MBTR is again unique fuel because France was supposed to give us enriched uranium. And in 1974, when we made the peaceful nuclear energy explosion, you know, they said, no, you are going for non-peaceful purposes, will not give you. So we had a problem, construction was going on, and there was no fuel. Then we said, OK, what is the fuel which is available to us? So from thermal reactors, we get plutonium. And with that plutonium, we can use it in the fast filter reactor. And the composition which is stable is called carbide, carbide of plutonium and uranium. And that fuel, we use it into the reactor. And that is a unique thing. So far, nobody has used that one. And that we were forced to do that. And in 1985, when this BTR become critical, we have used that fuel. And today, the very fortunate for us, 
it is behaving excellently which is here going on next these are the various components which are being made for the fast blood reactor sodium pump reactor vessel rotating plugs and other now a btr operation which is here now you can see the sodium pumps which are very critical component like heart heart in our body which is used which are used 1 lakh 35 thousand without being taken out that is the beauty of the sodium pumps and today it has gone this is the old figure 2 lakh 50 thousand hours are it is running without being taken out of this of course motor and other thing we do repair other thing but we don't have sodium pure is very easily maintained at 105 degrees centigrade plugging temperature which is there which is about one to two ppm parts per million of oxygen is there into that and oxygen we have to control it for reducing the corrosion of the stainless steel which is now this is the next uh, reactor which we have got pfbr flow sheet this is a pool type reactor this we call pack up we designed the earlier on ebitier we had a collaboration with france dr vikram sarabhi and then he made the collaboration so we built that but construction was done in india operation is being done by indians and other and this reactor which is here you can see there is a primary circuit there is a secondary circuit sodium and there is steam water circuit again turbine and it goes into that so that portion remains same schematically for other next reactor now the cost reduction there are various methods of cost reduction I will not go into the details of that one. How you can reduce the cost, which all that thing that is shown over there. So what we did, primary circuit, four pumps were there. We made two bigger size, heat exchanger, eight to four. Secondary circuit, four loops we got. And you see the steam unit, 36 to eight. So this was the trend after that cost, which I told you, no? two times, three times cost was higher than that. Next one. Next. Now, the main characters of the PFBR, which is under construction at Kilpakam, is 1250 megawatt thermal, 500 megawatt electrical, and it is a pool type sodium. But there we are using plutonium oxide, uranium oxide. The carbide fuel, though it has given us this one, is pyrophoric. Pyrophoric means if it comes in contact with air, it catches fire. So it is a dangerous uh, in that sense. It's outside. The reactor where in the fabrication shop but in the dangerous here so we have used for oxide fuel those are the diameter and component number of components we designed it for 40 years of life and still possible to go higher if you generate more data and other this is how the primary circuit is there you can see the yellow which is at 400 degrees centigrade that sodium is pumped through the grid plate through the core which is heated by fission and we take it out that red one you see that is the hot sodium at 550 degrees centigrade and this is how the sub assemblies are arranged within hexagonal pattern around surrounding something you can see over there the red one which is here and then that is the zone one called we call it another one is zone and then surrounding that is the blanket that is uranium 30 we put it here so the neutrons which are leaking out are electrons which are there they get converted to, to have and the black one which you see there it is the control rods which are there so we move the control rods up and down and that is how with the electrical motor at the top and that is how we control the chain reaction next this is the sub assembly how it is there how the pins are arranged into that one next this is what happens in the fuel if you see there inside of course you cannot see that this is only a schematically shown the cladding hexagonal cladding is surrounding the red one is uranium and the center is a hole which is formed there because of the temperature gradients so it migrates the fuel migrates into that one so this is how the structure is this is the control rod is there next the comp components which are there were very complex in shape you can see these inner vessel this is the grid plate of sodium pipes which are there next this is the support for the grid these are the control rotor mechanism. This is called a control plug, which is very complex component, which is here. You see the bottom one, center one, which is there. So many tubes, they go through that. In that one, we put thermocouples to measure the temperature of sodium, which comes out of the core. 
Next one. This is called the rotating plugs, which are here. Next. Now, these are the two loops which are there, one side one loop, another one the loop. Earlier, we had a four like this. This is the sodium pump, primary sodium pump. Next, this is the intermediate heat exchanger. This is the steam generator, one through type steam generator. Water enters here and goes out as a steam. It is not like, you know, circulation, drum type. This is the decay exchanger removed. Next, go ahead, this is the fuel handling machine. Next. Next is another fuel handling machine. So these are the various reactors, reactions, which take place with sodium. So we have to take care of it. And this is the PFBR uh, schematic drawing, which is there. Central portion, you see the reactor. On this side, there is a turbine. And then the rectangular, which is there inside, is the switch yard, where the switch, uh, transformer and other things are put into that one over there. We'll Next. Now, these are the fast builder reactors which are built so far, which is there, United States, USSR, United Kingdom, France, Germany, Japan, India, and last one is China, which is here now. Now, you see here, so many reactors US has built. USSR has built more number of neutrons, which are the reactors which are built. UK built only two. France built only three. And Germany, which is built there, but they operated only small reactor, the large one. They could not operate here because of the opposition. Public, their own public opposition was there, so it could not have it here. Japan. And then we have built one reactor now operation and one under commissioning stage. Now this is just a location on the globe where all the locations reactors are there. Next. Now this is in UK. This is called Dundre Fast Reactor. Next. This is their absolute reactor in Kadarash, which we use for collaboration. But they were giving the heat to the atmosphere, air. But we are using for production of electricity, which is next. This is the Enrico, just Enrico Fermi fast builder reactor, which was built in the USA. And it was the first commercial reactor for production of electricity. This is the French reactor P Phoenix. This was built. This is a 250 megawatt electric. Which has next. This is a Joyo reactor in, in Japan, which is a small reactor, 100 megawatt thermal. Next. This is the BN600. It is operated now for 40 years. Very good, excellent reactor, which was operated fast builder reactor, was this BN600. And this is the Kalpakam fast builder reactor, which you got. The central one is a dome inside which the reactor vessel is there. On this side, there is a turbine. On that time, experimental facilities are there to see the fuel behavior, how to move behaviors. Next. Now, this is the Super Phoenix reactor built in France. Because France has had no natural resources of any kind. They don't have oil, they don't have gas, they don't have uh, oil, gas, uh, and then they don't have hydraulic projects. So they don't need to have it on nuclear one, which is there. So they built with large number of thermal reactors, PWR type reactors, and they also said, you go back. So this is, Chokshi, you go back. Huh? You go back. Huh. Uh, so this is a Super Phoenix reactor. It is 1,200 megawatt. It's a very huge size reactor, which is there. And it was built, but its cost was 2.2 times the PWR. Now, when this was built, there were opposition, public opposition was there. A lot of plutonium will come there, you will make bombs. So people started opposing. Uh, there is an opposition party, Green Party, called, you know. They also started opposing that one. And then, it, because it is very costly, operation also will be very costly, so it is there. And public opposition, which was there. So this reactor, after about seven years of operation, they discontinued it. Huge cost money was gone there, but they say we don't care on that. Next. Now, this is the latest one. It is called China Experimental Reactor. It is a 65 megawatt thermal reactor, which was commissioned two years back, two or three years back. And this is how the that function they made it here, reactor critical and all. Now, this is BN800. After BN600, they built BN800, where the cost has been reduced. And it is the best operating reactor in the world. 
So Russians made a progress one after the other thing, but they were very successful. Whereas other countries, they left the reactors. The French people leave it, the German people leave it, the UK people left it, Japanese have left now recently. So the fast burner reactor, because of the political consideration, you know, I had given it two, three reasons. They said, we don't want fast burner reactor. Next. Next, go to next, next rate. Next. Now, in India, you know, we are producing what are the resources in India we have got and how it is growth has taken place, you see on this axis. So you see the fossil fuel, coal-fired power plant, we have built a large number because we have got large coal and that. So you see the growth was very fast there. But today we see that carbon dioxide, which is produced by the coal burning, is creating problems and climate change and all that thing. And nobody will like to have it, this type of thing. And then you have got the renewables, you know, solar, wind, hydro, these are there, but they are going out in that portion. You see the hydro is that one, the renewables is put it, now it has started increasing. So, you know, solar is going on very large scale now recently. And you see the nuclear one, which goes very the yellow one, which is very, very low contribution it is making to the nation, which is there. Next one. See, this is how the nuclear reactor capacity in India, it grew like that one over there, which is very, very slow progress was there at that one. I'll come to the reasons. Next. Now you see here in October 22, how the contribution is coming there. So you see the black one is cold, then you got gas, diesel, hydro, wind, and nuclear, you see where it's very small, which is about 1.7%. Now this 1.5% of energy, which we are producing now, that one is, is 70 years of our reactor. 70 years we are working till, you know, Atomic Energy Commission was established as a thing, but we had made, so we did have r and D base. Our industrial base was less. We were isolated from the world because we made bomb. And these reasons, they separated out India. It is called apartheid. And they, so for this reason, we have the, this. Now recently, you know what happened? Photovoltaic cells, they're used for production of electricity. And main use was there in the satellites. Because in the satellites, you get it from the sun every, Every time you get, every day you get the electricity from the solar world. So it was costly, but being an experimental thing or the, this one, they could afford that one. And then that technology is being now made into on the earth, which is here so that we can use it here. So the solar product. Okay, just two minutes. Five minutes will. Hi. Now, solar photovoltaic now, we are using it here because you see the cost from $76 per watt, it has come down, you see 0.3. So, so much of reduction of cost has taken place. That is why solar energy is beating this one. Next. Yeah. Now, next we go there. Next, is there and go. Over now. Okay. Yeah. So I would like to stop here. If any questions are there, we can take up some discussion which is here. So I'd like to thank you for giving me an opportunity in the CAT Indoor and IIT. And once again, sorry that I had to become suddenly ill. And uh, I went to the hospital and then thank you. So. Uh, sir, thank you very much for uh, giving your thought about the nuclear reactor. Yeah. And uh, since we are getting late, now I quickly moving ahead to the end of the program. Now I request to our director, Professor Sir Josie, to please uh, present the moment to, to our guest, yeah. uh, Sri S. P. Boje, sir, and Dr. Sekhar C. Mande, sir, and also to director of our CAT, uh, S. V. Nake, sir.
Yeah. Huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is very important. What? Tell. I'll tell you. Only place in Sanskrit. Yeah. Thank you. For oh, thank you very much. Thank you. Then, Josie, sir, please. Uh, so, yeah. I went to Monday, sir. Another is that, sorry, I have taken a little more time in giving you the more details about that. And, uh, and Kalpakam is the only place in the world where uranium-233, uranium-235 and plutonium, they are being burned into different type of reactors, which is there. Yeah. Yeah, and so, we are just got. Thank you, Professor Joshi. Thank you, sir. And so at the end, uh, I just quickly want to thank everyone, especially our guest, uh, Professor. Uh, we have with guests like uh, Professor uh, Sri S P Boje sir and uh, Dr. Sekhar Simande sir, and also like to thanks uh, Cat Director uh, Dr. S V Dakhe sir, and thank you, uh, Professor Joshi sir. So, okay, so sorry, I uh, actually, I request Prasanji to please uh, present the moment to uh, Professor Joshi. <laughs> and at the end, I would like to thank all the administrative staff and the committee member for uh, supporting this event. And at the end, I request all of you to please stand for the Mr. Anthem. Punjab <laughs> Jai. 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 So thank you very much. Please join us for a cup of tea outside the venue. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Ah.